All right. So my name is Tamara Osborne. I am going to be your uh, conductor for today's journey. So the environment rating scales. We all know that it's a part of our desired results system. We all know that it's this quality assessment. Um, I think one of the big parts about it, in the middle of the sentence on the screen, it says, these are designed to assess process quality in an early childhood or school age care group. And so I like to define what process quality is. And that's what children directly experience. If you can type that in the chat, that way I know you got what I said. Process quality is what children directly experience. Please type that inside the chat. It's what they experience in their programs uh, that has a direct effect on their development, including various interactions that go on in a classroom between staff and children, among children and other children, um, and also how children interact with materials and activities in that environment, as well as the features within that environment. So the space, the schedule, the materials, all that support how children are interacting with each other and adults. Process quality is assessed primarily through observation. We know how important formative assessment is for younger children, and it's been found to be more predictive of child outcomes than any kind of structural kind of checklist or indicators um, within a program. This information that I'm sharing with you can be found on the ERSI website. So when it comes to quality programs, in order to provide care and education that will permit children to experience high quality of life while helping them develop their abilities, the program must provide for these three basic needs, protection of health and safety, building those relationships, supporting and guiding social emotional development, and then of course opportunities for intellectual uh, and language stimulation, right? None of these is more important than the other. You need all of them for a quality program. Each of these three basic components manifest into something really tangible in your program, like your curriculum, your environment, things children get to touch and see. When it's time for your environment rating scale, as an administrator, you choose the correct age level instrument. You can either circle it on the screen, which ones are you using, or you can type it in the chat for me, which age level instrument are you using? All right, I see all the age groups coming in. I see school age. Yay, school age is represented today. I love it. I see Eckers R. Yep, Eckers R. I don't see family child care represented today. Oh, there it is. Hello, Nishia. So typically one question that comes here from new administrators or maybe not new ones only is, are we using Eckers R or are we using Eckers 3? So what's written into law, what's written into Title V, the contract that you hold with the state is that Eckers R is to be used in, uh, to assess all of the classrooms within your program. Eckers R is what's being used across all of the programs. I'm going to pause for any questions or anything I need to clarify. All right, I think we're good. I counted to 10 and everything. Let's go. <laughs> oh, there's our question. Don is asking, do you think the state will start using Eckers 3? Roxana says CDSS announced that uh, for family child care, 3 would be used now. Can we get confirmation, please? So I have CDSS on. CDSS, was that, can you confirm that for Roxana? Is family child care using the 3? Hi, Tamara. This is Erin. Um, like you stated earlier and stated in law, the R version is the one to be used. However, we are um, using a three when we come out and do our reviews. So you can use either one. You can use the R or you can use the three. We're not sure if we're going to go the direction of the three. So please don't run out and go spend a lot of money and buy, you know, all new threes for um, the environmental rating scale. However, with CDSS, you could use both. And then do I think the state will start using the Eckers 3? So for that to happen, there needs to be a change in the written law, the Title V. And you all know that changing the law takes time. So as of today, it's the R. <laughs> when the change happens, if the change happens, a management bulletin comes out from CDE or a pen, right? A, 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 I don't, it's called a pen, I think, through CDSS very similar to a management bulletin. So sign up for those email lists or so you'll be the first to know anytime something like that changes. All right, perfect. Thank you, everybody.
So just a little bit of background information about uh, Eckers. So I like to have somewhere to uh, kind of hang my hat when I talk about things so that I know how to co connect them. So I connect Eckers to a DRDP, like, oh, a subscale is like a domain. It's the bigger area. Inside of your Eckers, there will be subscales. There's seven subscales across all of the age groups. So for preschool, for infant toddler, for school age, for family child care, they all have seven subscales, seven big areas. Within those seven subscales, similar to our DRDP, there are individual items, something like a measure. 43 items in the yellow book. 39 in the blue book. And then for family or for school age, you have 47. For family child care, there are 38. If you registered for this session before, back in October, we asked you if you needed a book and we asked you which book you needed. So we sent these books out if you registered before October. If you registered later, then you received this, physical copies. We mailed this out. And if you just registered Friday, you probably didn't get it yet. But <laughs> we re we sent this out and we sent this out. I'm just saying everybody got something tangible and maybe you didn't get it yet, but we did send it. I'm asking about that or bringing that up because I want to know, for those of you who are very familiar with Eckerd, you've been doing this a while, you know that the items all have four levels of quality four levels of quality, kind of like a progression, like the developmental levels on your DRDP. So I'm going to ask you all either on the screen or in the chat, you can let me know what are those four levels of quality. And if you need a cheater, go ahead and open up one of those books, look above the items. There's four levels for every item. What are those four levels of quality? So your items of quality go from inadequate to excellent, from a one to a seven. That's one of the first things you want to be able to share with your teachers. The booklet that we shared with everyone, this training workbook, can be found on Amazon for four or five bucks. Inside of this training workbook, there are situations that you can use to train your staff. I cannot put the entire booklet onto your Google Doc. Instead, I can give you a couple of the pages that we could use today for our, for our training session. So right now I'm gonna give you 15 seconds. I want you to open up that Google Doc again. I'm gonna ask you to scroll down to where it says preschool video guide. I'll give you a few seconds to find that, open that up. Preschool video guide, right down here towards the bottom, preschool video guide. You got it, give me a thumbs up or say got it in the chat. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you. All right, I see them coming in. You're on the logistics doc, preschool video guide. When you open that up, you'll get a couple of pages from that workbook. Let me make this a little bit bigger. The first page goes into those subscales and items that I discussed. So you can see how there are seven subscale. One subscale is space and furnishing. Another one is program structure. Another is interaction. Underneath language and reasoning subscale, you have four items, right? So we talked about subscales and items. We already talked about the scale from inadequate to excellent scores from one to seven. This booklet is a way to teach your your teachers how to score. Because scoring can be kind of difficult, right? It's kind of confusing a little bit. It tells you that in order to get a number one, a number one is really bad, but you have to score yeses underneath that first column. That's kind of backwards. A yes means a one and a one is bad. Okay, something that you need to know. In order to get a two, what needs to happen? In order to get a three, what needs to happen? So forth. That's all available right here in this workbook. I'm going to ask everyone to please go to page seven. It's the last page. Inside the workbook, there are several sample situations. This one is a, is a paragraph. You're going to go into your breakout room. You're going to read the sample situation with your group. 
and you're going to score this sample situation for item number two. You can score it right down here below. You're going to schedule, you're going to check yeses and nos for 1.1, for 1.2, 3.1 until you get to until you get to where you can score it. You need to score item two for the situation that's here at the top. I'm gonna pause and see if I need to clarify anything. All right, you'll be in your breakout rooms for the next eight minutes. You have everything you need to do this activity. When we come back, we'll debrief how you got to the score you have. On your mark, get set, go. So, All right, you. welcome back, everybody. That's everyone. Who'd like to share the score they came up with? How you got there? Um, my this Myra. Um, I came up with the four because um five point one most furniture is child size. Half the furniture that kids couldn't reach. And um and five point two all furniture sturdy and good repair yes five point three it was a yes so five more than half a number five um well, I don't know. came up with the four <laughs> all right sounds like plan you got a four you told us how you got there everyone else would you all get you can type it in the chat look at that there's some iterator liabilities we got fours up the door um. I know my group has said a four, but now I'm debating between the five. Tell us more. <laughs> I'm gonna go for the four because my group has said four. <laughs> <laughs> but now that because of what um my Myra, I think it was, yes, said it was like wait. <laughs> So I um I want to see what you see. So we got some fives. Um, five point three was a not applicable. Thank you very much, Catherine. So I'm gonna go up to the scoring part first. First, the important part is once you're in that column, right? The ones, the threes, the fives. You have to finish rating that column because it says. Is it at least half of the indicators? So I don't know if it's half of them if I only stop at the first one and there might be multiple indicators there. So even if you got to a no at the 5.1, you wanna rate the rest of them so that you can calculate a correct score, if that makes sense. And in order to get the, the score of four, it says all of your indicators under three have to be yes and at least half of what's under five has to be at a yes. So in order to know if it's half or not, I have to rate all of them, right? I have to figure that out and rate them all. I see some threes in the, I'll change to four. <laughs> no need to change to four. We just wanna make sure we explain that and be able to have somewhere to reference back when you're working with your staff on how to do that as well. How do I score? How did I get to this number? Why did I choose that number? One of the activities inside of the book that or the logistics doc I gave everyone is the iterator reliability activity. And the iterator reliability activity gives you a document. They can look at these sample situations inside of that booklet and then use those and see where everyone can do something similar to what we just did and then justify how they got there. That helps them understand the assessment. In addition to that, this booklet, this little white workbook booklet has a companion video. The video is available on the website Vimeo and I put that link on your document. So yes, you can use the sample situations in the booklet and you can use the video. The video will say, or the booklet will say, go to this section in the video, have everyone watch it, have everyone rate, have everyone discuss. So no need to recreate those things if they already exist. I'm gonna pause for any comments or thoughts. <clears throat> I just wanna uh, make sure I understood because there's been a debate 
with you know different supervisors and different people. In this case, on the sample that we're doing, if we say yes to all the threes, we move to the fives. And then if the fives, even if 5.1 is a no, we continue all the way to the end of five. Yes. You have to continue the five. That's to the end so of five. To do the half or not. Okay, because we got the no. Even though we got the first no, we still finish the one column on the five. So this one right here, this five only has three indicators. But what if it had four? What if it had more than just these three? You oh, need to make sure keep... about the half part. And I can't tell you if it's half or not if I didn't do all. Oh, okay. So let's say on the five, the number five, it had 5.4. We need to go all the way to the bottom and then decide, okay, it's four items and it's two. Two will make it half. Yeah. Now, question, when we have the not applicable, it immediately cancels it out. That means we don't have to count that one? Correct, you don't count that one. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. So I heard that, go ahead, Don. Um, I just have a question. Um, we had our um, Eckers score done recently, and this was one of our lower areas in regards to the child sure. size furniture, because I have a classroom of 23 to five-year-olds, and um, the majority of them are pretty little, but then I have a handful of big three and four-year-olds. And so to have the furniture the appropriate size for my little guys can reach the floor, my bigger kiddos can't get under the table. So we kind of just pushed all of the tables up a little bit where my little guys have like their feet are dangling, but we have like a block underneath to kind of help, but it's just like a double-edged sword. And I'm not sure if you have some thoughts or suggestions for those bigger guys that need under the table and the little guys who are kind of swinging. I do, but we have some experienced admin on here. So I'm going to ask them to tap in and tell you Please. what they're doing. <laughs> experienced That's admin, how do you support many children of different sizes? In our sites, we actually have a few chairs because typically um, they're all like smaller, right? The threes and the fours, um, but we do have some that are a little bit bigger. So some site, well, a lot of the sites have a few chairs that are smaller than the rest of the chairs. So when they sit in those chairs, their knees are are exactly like the, the, the smaller kids. So I think what I hear you saying is that your chairs are not all the same sizes. No, yeah. Right. So I have some smaller chairs for those little ones and I have some bigger chairs for the taller for the I have little chairs for the taller ones, bigger chairs, whatever. I have multiple size chairs. <laughs> and then the tables get to are also adjustable, right? Tables can go yes. up, can go down. So then yeah. that way you meet it because you can change tables as children grow. Oh, okay. Because see, our tables are pretty standard. Like to adjust ah. them, you would have to take out a bolt and a screw. I mean, they're pretty stationary. Whoa. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Something to think about. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. Because I just, they're all the same size. And for like, I have um, four, four-year-olds and they're almost 50 pounds. So, yep. and I'm getting a lot of like the kiddos that don't go to TK. And so it's just hard to accommodate for everybody to make sure everybody fits under the table. So I was just wondering for some ideas. Appreciate your time. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. There we go. You're so welcome. Glad. Thanks for the question. It's helping others too. They're telling you, thank you inside the chat. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we did a scoring on there. You know, what's available for you to train your staff with, to go back and look at those items and have those discussions. The next, I talked about the inner rater reliability. What I want to talk about next is what's required for from you as the administrator when it comes to completing your environment rating skills. So no matter the size of your program, no matter the size of your agency, your data is to be compiled at the classroom level for the environment rating skills. Each program is responsible that that data is then grouped by classroom or fetch and home, site, and then your program or agency. And then you write a summary of findings. You need a summary of findings for each classroom, and then you need a summary 
a, little, a summary of findings at the program level. So Sarah, great question. The, I know that ERS was adopted by the California State uh, as a part of their continuous improvement program back in 2001. So it's been a part of this since then. Uh, the last time it was updated, you'd be able to find that on the ERSI website. <clears throat> You're welcome. I know they put out a, a notice during COVID about uh, how ERS could work even in those situations. But when the last time that this was updated, I know there's ERS-3, but I don't remember what year ERS-3 came out. So agencies are required to do this part here. We have these documents. So when you're scoring, you have a score sheet, a score sheet that gives you a score for each of the items. Then each of those classrooms must complete one of these profiles based on those scores. You plot out your scores, you add and divide to get an average subscale score, and every classroom must also complete a, <clears throat> a classroom summary of findings. Here's where it gets a little tricky, so feel free to take out your pen or type this in the chat. Classrooms need to write their summary of findings at the item level. So in the chat, please write classrooms equal items. Well, Tamara, what are you talking about? What does that mean? I see the chat lighting up. Thank you, thank you. Classrooms equal items. So here's a sample of the profile sheet. On this sample, you'll notice that for subscale space and furnishings, eight different items, the score of six for item number one, indoor space, the score of seven for item number two, but there's a score of two for item three, a score of two for item four. So those are all plotted here, added and divided to get an average subscale score. For the classroom, any item under a five, any item under a five needs an action plan. Any item under a five needs an action plan. So if I'm looking at subscale two, personal care routines, how many of these items, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, how many of those items need an action plan? You can unmute, you can type it in the chat. Thank you, Nishia. There are five of them that need an action plan. Mills and snacks is under a five. Nap and rest is under a five. Toileting is under a five. Health practices is under a five. Safety is under a five. Those all need an action plan for that classroom. Now the summary of findings looks exactly the same from classroom to program. What you need to know is that for the classroom, I write it at the item level. Here's a sample that's on the screen. I can make this a little bigger, one second. So you can see here that they wrote out what their, I, the blocks came to a score of a one, dramatic play came to a score of a four. So they made an action plan for, all, for, for that. Here's my action plan about the blocks. Here's my action plan about what I'm going to do. And it's not just buy more blocks, but it's telling me how many, it's telling me when, and you'll notice that there's also a follow-up date. So we wrote this in November, but come March, we wanna go back and make sure that we were able to do what we said we wanted to do. And if we didn't do it, then we can make modifications to our plan. So we received 60 unit blocks, the window blocks are on back order. So we included cardboard blocks into the environment until those things arrive, right? So make sure that it's a living document that you go back to and add to. I'm gonna pause for comments, thoughts, clarification. Tamara, question for you. Yes. If, if the items are sort of related to each other, could you write one plan that sort of encompasses them all? Tell me more. Well, the example before where several different items were, <clears throat> excuse me, under a five, 
if the items were related, could they go under one plan or does there have to be a separate plan for every single item? I think there needs to be an action step that says how you are going to fix what that item is. So if the item okay. is that, right, because some of them are, I didn't have enough dramatic play clothes. Some of them are, we didn't have music outside some, or that we didn't have music readily available. How are you going to fix it? All right. So that's our sample for the classroom. Um, it's two pages long, Leticia. That's why you don't see the dramatic play on there. Uh, there's a sample of this and it's on your Google Doc. I could only make a screenshot of one of the first page, but we made the document. Thank you. So we can list all the items on the one paper and then just keep adding the steps underneath. I would say yes. And I have CDSS and CDE on so that they can clarify. Is that what you guys are looking for? That they can put it all on one and list their actions there? Hi, Tamara. It's Erin. Um, they can do that, but some of your steps to the action plan might be really lengthy. So you might need you know more space to be able to write those. But if you really feel like in that time period, you can attain all of those things, if it's something as simple as getting more materials, then oh. absolutely you can put it all on there. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Same team for Hi Tamara. This is Sandra. Same team for CD. Uh, CD. Perfect. Thank you. So that's for our classroom. Items are classrooms. Now it's time for you, the big boss administrator. You got to write this out. The people looked up like, wait, what? What? <laughs> now you have to put all those classroom subscale scores together and get a program score for your subscale. We have this document on our website. It's also on your Google Doc that I provided to everyone for all of the different age groups. <laughs> so let's say you have one, three classrooms at your agency. Classroom one, classroom two, and classroom three. Uh, the document is called Compile Program Ecker Subscale Score. Or ITERS, or FETCHIN, or... Or, or family child care or school age. I'll show you where to find it on the Google Doc. One second. So you will, let me go back just to reference where you go. This little subscale score right here that each classroom got, right? Where they got the average of all their item scores. That will go here for that particular subscale. So if I got three classrooms, I put all those in, I average them and I get a score. If that score is below a five, if that subscale score is below a five, then I need to make an action plan for it. In the chat, subscale equals agency. Please type subscale is for agency. Now, just like we did before for the classroom, we provide a sample for your program as well. There's a date we wrote it. It's a date when we're going to come back and follow up. And then we put in the subscale and average scores. What were our average scores across all of the subscales? We write down what our key findings are because that's what we're going to attack. And then we put some very specific action steps. We're going to train our staff on poll strategies. We're going to have a classroom language building strategy training and expect all of our staff to infuse a new strategy every month from that training. So it's not just go to the training. What are you going to do with the information you got at that training? Who, how are you bringing it back to make changes? And then we're also going to, it says, oh, I can't do that. Include anchor charts into all of our classrooms. So thinking about, oh, I said poll strategies. Does everyone know what poll strategies are before I keep moving? No? Okay, so in, thank you for telling, multilingual learner toolkit. Maria, you're gonna place the link in the chat for me. There's a website called the Multilingual Learner Toolkit. It's amazing, I love it, it's great. It talks about many different strategies that can be used to support multilingual learners in, in many different settings, early childhood, zero to eight, and it's all color-coded. One of the, <clears throat> 
strategies or tools that they use is something called SEAL, which is well known across California. Another one is poll strategies. Um, poll strategies includes a couple of different things. It includes some parent surveys, it includes anchor charts in the classroom. It also includes things like cognates between different languages where children can learn how to make connections about vocabulary. So that's a really great set of strategies that are helpful in early childhood programs. Absolutely, Lexi, that is correct. There's only one summary of findings for environment rating scales. You use the same one for both the classroom and for the program, that is correct. Those do not get turned into CDE or CDSS. They stay on file with you to follow up with in case you need to modify the plan. Now, when you get monitored, not if, but when, when you get monitored, <laughs> they will ask for that document. Uh, the question is, isn't it a similar format as DRDP summary findings? It is similar, except with DRDP, there are two different ones. There's one for the classroom and there's one for the program action plan. So both of the summary of findings in DR do not look the same. Those two are a little different, but for ERS, it's the same one. For parent survey, it's the same. So just thinking about this process, it helps me to have pictures and think it through. You have a classroom assessment of your environment rating scales. You complete that on your score sheet. You find the profile sheet in the back of the booklet or on the website, complete the little dots, and then you write a classroom summary of findings for the items at a five or below. The agency level, you put those together, those subscale scores, any subscale below a five, you write an action plan for subscales below a five. I want you guys to kind of process the information we just talked about. So I'm going to ask you to let me know what are some ideas or thoughts you may still be having about environment rating scales. I'm gonna place this Padlet inside the chat box, place you inside of your breakout rooms for the next six minutes. And in order to add to the Padlet, you simply select the plus mark in the corner and then you can add a box. So what questions do you still have? Thank you, Sandra. And you can type those questions here. You'll be in your breakout rooms for how long? Who's with me still? Six minutes. Six Thank minutes. Thank you. Six minutes, Cookie Fresh. One of the questions here is around um, how many do you need to do a year? The other is when's the best time to complete? So the requirement is that every classroom is assessed once a year. That's the requirement. Every classroom needs to be assessed once a year. There are some programs who go to the next level and they do their own pre and post if they have time, energy, and materials and resources to make that happen. The requirement is that it happens once a year. Also, when it, uh, what is the best time to complete the environment rating styles? I'm going to open up the Google Doc again. And underneath resources, there is a self-study checklist. It says other resources. Oops, don't move that under other resources, there's a document that says self-study checklist for classroom, self-study checklist for program agency. Please open that up. <clears throat> so we are working with CDE and CDSS to provide you the information you need. There's some things that are required and you have to do. There are some things you have leeway with about when you do them. Here's my comparison. DRDPs you have to do, those are required within 60 calendar days of enrollment and every six months thereafter, right? So that all depends on when the child started, how long they stay in your program. Things like your environment rating scale and your parent survey, the state doesn't give you a date of when it has to happen. They say you gotta do it. You, as the program administrator, with your board, with your staff, get to figure out what's the best time of year to do that for our staff. So as a director, right, my first year as a director, all of these things got pushed at me and I was like, oh my goodness, 
I don't know. So I just did them and there was no thought process. My parent surveys were being done in May. My environment rating scales were being done in March. And then as I became more seasoned, it dawned on me, oh, it doesn't make sense to do a parent survey that late in the year because my parents don't get to see that their voice was heard in the program if they're leaving me in the fall. So I moved my parent surveys to happen in the fall. So they would do them in August. We'd make changes based on what they saw. And then I'd do a post to see if what I did really met their needs. The post wasn't required, but it was my way of making sure that my parents knew their voices were being heard. Same thing with the environment rating skills. If I wait till the end, is that really supporting the children that I have right now? So you get to decide where it fits for your program year. I had just put a question on the chat. When you refer to a uh, program star month one, month, month two, month three, are is it following the fiscal year, July to June? So it depends on your pro. Yes, there is a fiscal year. And yes, the program self-evaluation is due in June. When your program, right, they don't put months here because it depends on when your program starts. Everybody's program doesn't start at the same time of year. So whatever month it is, you can, this is edit. You can edit this document and put in when those things are going to happen. When are you doing your environment rating skills? When are you doing your parent meetings? When are you doing the parent surveys? When you need them to come back? And this one is for the program and agency. This one's for you. The second page is one for your staff so that they're not caught off guard about what's happening and when those things are due. Feel free to turn this into an electronic one where you can edit and send it out to everyone via email. Many different options to keep everyone in the loop about what we're doing as a program. Thank you. You're welcome. Those are the two that stood out. Tamara, in our um, breakout group, we talked about um, the action plans. And if you have um, an item that will always be below a five and it's due to like facility constraints or um, in, one of our examples is um, one of our administrators works for like a crisis center. And so the school has to stay locked down and parents can't come in. Do you have to do an action step for that? Is there something that needs to be wrote in regards to that? Do you just skip it knowing your facility doesn't allow that to happen? Like what would you suggest? So I suggest it, uh, I suggest communicating with your consultant. Okay. Right, because maybe you have this consultant for the last three years, but they decided to retire and now you got a new one. Right. Okay. So you wanna you wanna be able to communicate with your consultant about that and ask them what makes more sense for them. I'm sorry that I spoke for the consultants on the call. <laughs> that was good advice, Tamara. Good job. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I just want to hear thank you so much, Tamara. You're right. I want we want to listen to the story of what's going on. Okay, perfect. So that way we can explain, like, um, I was just thinking of like provisions for personal needs of staff where it talks about like a lounge area at my center, our um, facility is so small, like we have an area where the parents come in and it has the children's cubbies and then it's the classroom. So we will always get that lower score. And so I guess that would just be a conversation as to why, you know, we just don't have the square footage. Yep, yep. Absolutely. So the questions about how long does it take to complete? Do I need to interview the, te the lead teacher? All of those are inside of your yellow book. All of those are on the frequently asked questions of, on the ERSI site. The answer is yes. The lead te A part of a full, re valid, reliable ERS assessment is that your teacher is interviewed. A, a valid assessment of ERS in the booklet, it says at least three hours. And if it's full day, you wanna be able to see what happens in the morning and what happens in the afternoon. If you have the luxury of having an outside assessor come in, that's great. But in my experience, those outside assessors only do one of your classrooms. And if you have five, those other four still need to get done. So something that's very helpful that I would do with my teachers is I would have them swap rooms. So who's ever in room three, I need you to go do an ERS on room one, just to give a non-biased you know, non look at the classroom. 
Do you have a link to the questions to ask to the lead teachers? I do not have that. That happens from outside assessors who are, uh, what, what do you call it, ERS certified? Is that right? All right. So let's go. I have one last thing to cover as we are closing out to the end. Can you take multiple days for what? Um, it's usually done in one setting. I think you can ask your consultant what they are looking for. I have so I have Sandra and I have Aaron. Do you want to answer that question? Um, it shouldn't take you multiple days. Uh, but I mean, I could see with a three-hour preschool program how something might happen. But it's intended to be done in one one day, for sure. Yeah. So, and that's why do you have to schedule your uh, observations um, to see all the routines and meals? So. Yeah, yeah, you just got to be strategic about how you do it. Just going back to the uh, pre previous questions about uh, different dates, it's probably um, not recommended too because you will have different teachers, different students. Um, so it wouldn't have a, a reliable information if we are doing it in different dates. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you. Lexi, was there a specific question you wanted me to answer? Um, I, yeah, I was just curious um, about my question of when do people usually give out their summary of findings after they've completed the ERS? Um, and then do they also give out a copy of the tool to the to the teacher um, or just the summary of findings? Um, I so. I have a couple of things going on in my head. I have an outside assessor who comes. I have them speak to my teacher about what's going to happen. I, as the administrator, have already prepped my teacher about what environment rating skills are and what this assessor is about to do and what they're looking for. And I don't mean prep like go set up the classroom so that it looks exactly what they're looking for, but it's not a surprise that an assessor is coming. And it's not a surprise that the assessor is doing an environment rating scale. Right. So my teachers are already familiar with what the scales are and what they're and and what this person is doing here. When that is over and that assessor is done, they will give them the score sheet. Mm. They might give them the score sheet or they might just give them that profile sheet that says how they scored where and they put notes on there. So there are a couple of options about what they get handed. The mm. summary of findings is written with your teacher. Right. Oh. With the score in item one. What are we going to do about it? Because the assessor can't do anything about what happens in your program. We got a number three on item one. What are we going to do about that? I see. So you do the summary of findings with the with the provider. OK. Did not know that. Thank you. OK. Uh, are we able to use the old summary of findings form at the classroom level? Leo was different, a little easier to follow in the past. Um, usually, you know, I'm going to ask Sandra and and Aaron to 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 answer. So this is what I think you're talking about. The old form used to be landscape, and this one is now horizontal. Can we still use the landscape one? That's what I think the question is. Is that right? The question came from Naisha Roberts. Naisha, is that right? She said, yes, correct. Okay, so for all my consultants, do you <clears throat> care if it's on the landscape or the, the other handout? I'll let somebody else answer. I feel like I've been answering everything. I will say, um, I'll take, uh, gosh, that's a really, well, I'll take the old forms as well, but it depends on the consultant as well. So um, if you have the new form, it'll be better to use the new form just to keep it um, consistent with everything that we are changing. So if you you're available to use a new form, let's, let's use the new form. And then for full day, do we visit in the a.m. and come back in the afternoon? Or do we schedule our three hours during midday? So you do the first one, right? You want to see what happens in the morning. You want to see what happens in the afternoon. 
because it's asking for certain parts of the day, right? It's asking what happens at nap, what happens when they go outside, what happens when they're in small group, what happens at greeting, what happens at departure. So my last breakout room group or activity for all of you is thinking about, just to think about creating and maintaining bias-free inclusive environments inside of your early childhood spaces. <clears throat> So I put the charge inside of the chat. On your Google Doc, you have a handout. And let me show it to you to make this easier for everyone. So on your Google Doc, it's the very last article and it's titled, How Can You Create a Learning Environment That Respects Diversity? Please go ahead and open that up. So this document goes over what's happening and what's being reflected in the environment with children that you are current, children and families that you are currently supporting. And now the first couple of pages are great information. I'm gonna invite you to go and take a look at that on your own time. But what we're gonna do right now is scroll to the page that says, take a look at your program. So what I placed inside the chat is what our charge is, right? What you're going to do is take a look at this page and there are several questions. This is a question, does your environment reflect diversity? Do you have materials for children? Does the environment accurately reflect diverse groups of? And then it's about eight questions. Your charge is to think about which question will you use? You're gonna go back to your group and you're gonna talk about making sure I have this bias inclusive environment. Which one are you going to use to guide conversations with your staff? Either about maintaining something we already do. We already put up family pictures everywhere. Or how do I change something we're doing to be more inclusive about it? We put up family pictures, but we don't put up everybody's. What do we need to do differently? Either something I need to continue to do or something I need to change. Choose one of those questions on there. You might choose multiple that you're going to use to direct the conversation with your staff. The second part of this is how does this connect with your environment rating skills? All right, we'll be in your breakout rooms for the next 10 minutes. It's 2.35. We'll be back at 2.45. 10 minutes on your mark. Get set. Welcome back, everybody. All right, who's going to be our first one to share? What was one or two of the questions you chose from the document? I can go first. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so in our group, um, we discussed about this, um, this question: Does the environment accurately reflect a diverse group of a diverse group of people's school? Is that one? <laughs> yeah. The question. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um. So um um we were sharing that um in the classrooms um I don't um directly work uh in the classroom but I do visit classrooms so um what we were sharing in in the chat group was that um the teachers use um music different uh, pictures books um family pictures. Um, and they sing songs, uh, they have pictures in display. Um, I, uh, I think that's, that's it. And also, um, I guess it, it, the use of, um, I say, I say food already, right? Food mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. cooking and different activities that reflect the, um, the diversity in the, in the group. Great. I think one of the parts of this question is also encouraging teachers to, yes, reflect who's in your group and the children and families you have, but also look outward for those other racial groups that might not be reflected inside of your classroom. Also. So just thinking about the next step, right? What's the next step to also always continuous improvement? Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? One more person? Um, uh, if you don't mind, so, um, we, I was talking with, um, our group and one of the things we talked about is incorporating parents does the, and the one we talked about as well was, does the environment accurately reflect a diverse group of people's current daily lives and really being authentic 
in creating that inclusive environment because our environment is the community, the children that we serve. And that that is a very respectful, authentic way. It's honoring our families. It's honoring our children. And um, whether it's a parent who comes in and shares um, a special tradition, a story, a song, and also finding ways to connect. Um, we, we talked about a bread study. So bread is universal in so many different cultures and con countries. It's a way to bring children together and families together. And it's concentrating on our similarities rather than only concentrating on the differences. So it brings children and families together as well. And that's another thing that we talked about. Um, creating things, creating that learning experience out of the familiar to bring in the unfamiliar. Start with your familiar to bring in the unfamiliar. Beautiful. Thank you. It made me think about um, something I learned or saw in that multilingual learner toolkit I told you about. There's this idea called reverse field trips, where instead of the children going to a place, the parents who work at those places come to them and show them what they do. So there's a there's a story in there about a parent who um, was in technology and built these little trash robots or worked at the uh, waste management and they had robots that did the recycling for them. So he brought the robot to school. Right. I was like, oh my gosh. What a cool idea. So having a parent who works at a car wash, having them bring that to the school, right? Reverse field trips. That way it's about the children's daily lives and what their families are doing as, in addition to if you can also go out and visit. So yeah, great ideas. Thank you, thank you. Ooh, hopefully you can put these questions together some kind of way, have conversations with your staff, what do we need to do to make sure that our environments are um, open and inclusive of everyone who comes into our program and into our agency? Thank you all so much for being a part of that. While you were in your breakout rooms, I was reviewing your questions to make sure I got to all of them. So as far as Learning Genie goes, this first question here, that's a question for Learning Genie, not a question for me, right? Learning Genie gets to choose what's inside of their software. So I can't answer that question. How do you complete one program Program summary for multiple classrooms. So that's what we talked about when we looked at this guy here. So I have multiple classrooms in my program. All of those classrooms give me a subscale score and I get an average and that's my program subscale score that I use. So that's how you write it at the program level. You have to average the subscale of all your classrooms. Let me know if I need to say that differently. And then from the date of the action plan, is there time to revisit your action plan? So revisiting your action plan should probably happen every two or three months, right? Did I do what we said we were going to do? You can set that schedule. I don't know how often you're, you have team meetings, but if you have a regularly scheduled team meeting, that might be a time to bring up. This is what we said we we're going to do. Are we doing that yet? Uh, subscale is between a five and a six. Do you still need to put it on the summary of findings? So you write your summary of findings for things that are below a five. If everything is above a five, choose your lowest one be that a 5.3, a 5.4, and made an action plan for that because there's always continuous improvement that can happen. I think we told, do you also give a copy? I think we talked about this one. How long after completing? I think we talked about this one and that one. This says, will there be a spreadsheet for multiple classrooms? So environment rating scales, Thelma Harm and, and the environment rating scale group has not created a a spreadsheet. If you have one that you hold on to in your own and you don't tell anybody, I won't tell anybody. I don't. <laughs> if it works for you and you created it, that's that's wonderful. And then there were some answers about the hand washing. We answered those two. We answered this one and we answered that one. So I think I got to all the questions. Yes, you might need to use multiple pages. <sighs> 
Um, the homework information will be emailed to you as long as you sent a message to Maria letting her know that you didn't receive it the first time. Tamara, I have a, I have a quick question. Um, uh, you mentioned on my earlier question that like a, an actual certified rater would, would they be scoring it as well right during part of the observation? Or not during, but like at the end of it to give them their score or is it done after? Ask it again, please. So I actually, let me just ask it to, to, <laughs> to go with what I'm doing in my, in our program is, so I am not a certified rater for the, okay. for the ERS. Um, mm -hmm. So after I finish my, you know, assessment, I then go back to my office and score later. Are you saying though that an actual certified person would oh. give them their score then and there? Um, in my experience, it hasn't been then and there. They okay. go back and then they they'll come back to you. Has anyone had a different experience? It's usually not then and there. They like go back and look over their notes and they make sure that they have something to share and kind of scripted it out. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, you become certified through ERSI the Environment Rating Scale Institute. You can find that information on the RC website. All right, so resources to help you, RC website. Uh, there's also a article called Conducting a Realistic Self-Assessment. It's on your Google Doc. It's a great document that you can use to have uh, what I call like a book read or an article read with your uh, group, maybe a lunch and learn where we read this and who pulled out golden lines? What is it that we learned that we weren't doing before? Um, some other resources include, let's go back to that Google Doc, um, some other articles, making long lasting changes. All of those subscale score reports are on here. All of the profiles are here and the videos. There's even an ERS document that can help you kind of map out when you might want to do your environment rating scales in your program and the resources you would need to help you do that. All right, we are coming to the end. At the end, I'd like to make sure that we tell you what's coming up next. The next time we're all going to meet will be February 7th. I want to say happy holidays to everyone. Happy New Year. I'm going to end my training the way I end all of my trainings and invite you all to turn on your cameras, unmute your lines. The count of three, we will say happy holidays. One, two, three. Happy, happy holidays. holidays. Bye, everyone. Have a good one. Bye.